I'm moving to, to the concept number three, and that's interpreting. This is now not how psychoanalysts understand what we are made of. This is how psychoanalysts hope to be able to work. The basic idea is that you cannot be cured by operations or medication or uh, baths or diet or whatever. You can be cured only by gaining insight into what truth is. So, as long as you don't know the reasons for your suffering, the suffering will not go away. The way to treat that is to fight against forgetting. Neurotics suffer from the forgetting. Psychoanalytic treatment should help them remember what happened, understand how that influenced their life, and then the problem will disappear. As long as you cannot remember, you will have to repeat. You may divorce, but each time you will marry the same psychological type of person. You may get rid of one addiction, but you will immediately find the next one. You may get rid of one type of symptoms, but immediately other symptoms will appear. There is a distinction, a dichotomy in the world of psychoanalysis between thinking and action. In my opinion, this is overemphasized. But psychoanalysts believe that what should happen in the treatment is that you think and you try to help your client start thinking, but that you should, no should do nothing. You should not be active in any way. You just think and you just say what is the result of your thoughts. The truth in the case of mental disorders and symptoms is not something the person can achieve on their own. Otherwise, they wouldn't come for treatment. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a major complaint. The task of the psychoanalyst is to provide this truth to the patient and then, as a consequence of that, the patient will gain an insight into the unconscious conditions and constellations. The insight is not mere cognitive understanding. Is it, not, it is not like the explanation of a theory, even a theory in psychoanalysis. It is something that is followed by the emotional side of it, which shows you, in a way, not cognitive, maybe not verbal, that this is something important. I have just realized something important. There is something special in this moment of realization. This has led to psychoanalysis for a long time being actually a talking cure, where the importance of words, of interpretations, was extremely high. I believe, again, this is overemphasized for a long period of the development of psychoanalysis and sometimes even being in silence together or actually doing small things for the client may be as beneficial or more beneficial than the actual words. This is the basic rule of psychoanalysis. This is where everything starts when it comes to the clinical situation. One most important thing that is required of the client is to speak his or her mind. This is the, 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 the free association idea. So this is one of the formulations that can be varied in different ways. To please say everything that comes through your mind, no matter if it may seem to you irrelevant, embarrassing or stupid. So the client is invited most often to be on the couch, and just speak his or her mind. Say whatever comes to their mind. If it seems completely irrelevant, we believe in the end we are going to discover that there is an unconscious chain, an unconscious red thread that collects, that, that connects all of those. The basic theoretical idea behind this is that we need to reassociate what trauma has dissociated. So like Anna O, oh, talking and talking and talking, hopefully the client will stumble upon something that's very important and hopefully the analyst will be listening carefully enough 
to be able to understand which moments are important. There are, believe it or not, various books devoted to the issue of the analytic listening, how uh, it's different than other forms of listening. Initially in the world of psychoanalysis, the basic recommendation was that the analyst should be like a blank screen, mostly silent. One influential psychoanalyst wrote in a book that I think was published in 1949, Psychoanalytic treatment starts when the patient realizes not only that the analyst is silent, but that the analyst is going to remain silent. And then the unconscious, hopefully, of the patient will start working and expressing itself. And as long as the analyst is like a blank screen, whatever is on the screen will be the projection of the unconscious world of the patient. And then we will be able to understand it, observe it, see it, understand it, and interpret it. These are some of the details about how psychoanalytic interpretations should be used. One of the things I, I would like to emphasize, in the world of classical psychoanalysis, probably until 1960s and 1970s, these were the only things psychoanalysts would say, interpretations. Many psychoanalysts around the globe would not say good morning or have a nice weekend or anything of the kind. And interpretations sometimes would be one per session, one per week. The analyst would be there, but as you may have seen psychoanalysis portrayed in movies or caricatures, psychoanalysts mostly used to sit in silence and provide uh, these cherished interpretations only from time to time. Interpretations are what you practice most in your supervisions, especially in your first control case. The, the art of interpretation, how to find the exact moment when the interpretation should be provided, how to phrase it and so on and so on, is something you practice for years and probably even after you finish with your supervisions you practice it for life. Psychoanalysts have tried to interpret everything. I cannot think of any form of human activity that psychoanalysts did not write at least one paper. So dreams, arts, society, various cultural products, wars and politics on one side, and then uh, consumer society or Facebook and similar things. And then many of the things uh, psychoanalysts see as being opposite to what we believe they are. And in a case that is, in a way, not completely confirmed historically, when Freud was asked, what about his cigars? Because Freud was heavily addicted to cigars. Some claim he smoked 20 of those a day. And, and these are not cigarettes, but cigars. Freud allegedly said, well, cigars are sometimes, well, a cigar is sometimes just a cigar. And this is, if true, an attitude that I don't like at all, because psychoanalysts analyze everything and everyone, but then when they are supposed to be analyzed, all of a sudden the story is over. And this attitude of self-reflection, I believe, is the most important thing you can gain, gain from psychoanalysis. When it comes to the clinical work, there are two major phenomena interpretations are focused on. One is resistance. Resistance is a phenomenon, maybe in a way you may, may be all familiar with it, that although you are coming there regularly, you are finding enough time and enough money to be there, come several times per week, travel across the city, and there is a pain in you, you're suffering from something, you would like to improve, there is still something in you that opposes any improvement. The world as you know it now, the pain as you know it now, is something predictable for you. The pain away, you enter the moment of unpredictability. You have no idea what the world will look without these symptoms. So there is some ambivalence in you. You want to feel better, and at the same time you want everything to stay the same. So that's a very important obstacle, a very important barrier 
psychoanalysts need to work partly with and partly against. So there are various forms of resistance. Sometimes your character may be a resistance. And when faced with something, when confronted with something in, 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 in a psychoanalytic session, you may say, well, I'm just that kind of a person. So the resistance that you have in you is so familiar, you cannot see it from a distance and try to work on it. And sometimes transference can be resistance. And, and we'll, we'll return to that in a moment, and I hope this claim will be clear then. 